laid off 175 employees, called my attorney and said, we might go bankrupt. How did this guy go from scraping by on odd jobs to raking in $50 million in restaurant sales without any prior experience or much cash? We were opening that business with $30,000 of borrowed money. In this video, Jim reveals how being laid off became his golden ticket to millions. And I got laid off right before Christmas. It was that day I decided I'm not gonna uh, continue to work for other people that control my income, right? The exact side hustles that he found online that made him a fortune. I started a company and was like, wow, I'm gonna make some money on this. And the single most important entrepreneurship skill that helps anyone build a successful business. And I think that's the big reason there's so much failure. At some point, I was taught to use a yearly budget, and that changed my whole world. It showed me right at the bottom how much I was going to make that year. And I was like, wow, do I want to work the whole year and make that number? Mm -hmm. And I did. All right, let's get going and find Jim. He's probably in the kitchen making all kinds of food. <laughs> I hear Jim. Yeah. Must be him. Good morning. Are you Jim? <laughs> yeah, hi. You must be Paul. Yes, good to meet you, my friend. Nice to meet you, too. Beautiful place. How big is it? This place looks massive. By the it way. is big. Uh, it's about 6,500 square feet. Wow. And seats about 240 guests. All right. Well, before we dive into those details, tell us a little bit about what drew you into the restaurant business, because most of us know that it's a pretty challenging, difficult business to be in. Yeah. So what's your story? That's what I hear. So as a kid, single parent, my mom worked in restaurants as a waitress, as a bartender, as a server later on as a manager. And uh, I found myself at home watching all of my favorite chefs on TV cooking. Mm -hmm. And I kind of fell in love with food. And years later, I found myself at a point in life where I said, I want to do something that I enjoy. I want to make money from it. I want to make people happy. And I want them to pay me right there on the spot and be excited to come back again. And so I jumped into the restaurant business. Okay. How did you go from being laid off to starting a restaurant business? So in the union construction business, you kind of hear that layoffs are coming. Mm -hmm. And so I worked really hard to try to make myself one of the people that didn't get laid off, but it still happened. And I got laid off right before Christmas. And it was that day I decided I'm not gonna uh, continue to work for other people that control Kind You're of control done. my income, right? Right. Yeah. And ever since then, you've been working for yourself. Yeah, your back businesses. to working for myself. So, Guys, the pandemic, by the way, left Jim with a ton of extra time. What did he do? side hustles so keep watching to find out what worked and what didn't are you here most of the time in this particular location yeah i'm here like 75 percent of my time this is our biggest restaurant so. for sure you've probably got an office can we go check that out yeah let's check it out i'll follow you can you give us a breakdown of revenue so shan and i worked uh, every day all year she was the server i was the cook we we're at the restaurant every day at the end of the year we made thirty thousand dollars combined and I went, wow, what have I gotten myself into? Right. So year two, uh, I think we doubled our business. Now here we are 20 years later, pre-COVID at this restaurant, I was doing about $3 million a year. Right okay. now my budget is to do $2 million a year, mm -hmm. but I'm not open on Sundays and I'm not open on Mondays. Pulling up to the restaurant, I saw a really cool uh, food truck trailer. I wanna go check that out and show our audience. Let's do that. Yeah, let's right. do it. I'll follow you out. Perfect. Man, this trailer, I've seen a lot. We've interviewed many. Yeah. is pretty epic, Jim. So great job on, on the wrap and everything. Yeah, it's an awesome trailer. It had it a is. full commercial kitchen inside. And we were having so much fun it's pretty cool. uh, during COVID making different items. So we were like the first place in Ellensburg to do birria tacos and and just whatever he wanted to cook Mexican, I would do something the opposite maybe in uh, America. That gives us into the next question. And that is like, how did COVID affect restaurants, right? Yeah. How did you deal with the lost revenue? Uh, talk about anything that happened during those times. Yeah, I mean, it was the first time in business that I actually cried. Laid off 175 employees, called my attorney and said, we people. might go bankrupt. You know, I was just scared. So the first ghost kitchen I started actually was right inside of the Roadhouse Grill. Mm -hmm. I was the only employee. All of the ordering was online. You'd order your food. I would cook your food. And we got so busy that in about a week, I, I asked my wife, please come help me. And our daughter and my son came down and we were all in the kitchen. And then one by one, we started hiring our employees back mm -hmm. and uh, away we went. And then we went into the food trailer with Carlos and Jimmy's parked out in the parking lot and doing events. And uh, we actually had a 50 foot tent and we were feeding people. On New Year's, we did steak and lobster 
out of the Carlos and Jimmy's mm -hmm. food trailer and fed people in a tent. And they still talk about how much they loved it today. So if it wasn't for that pandemic, I mean, some of these wonderful opportunities wouldn't have come out of that. As crazy as it sounds, we did so many positive things mm -hmm. uh, because of COVID. And so I'm a better business person because of it. That's good, yeah. good to hear. Luck was on their side until what, your third location? You guys, so stick around because that's really when you guys learned the secret to business success. So if you wanna avoid those constant mistakes, keep watching. So we're in Ellensburg, how's the population here? It looks like a pretty small town. Yeah, it's 20,000 people, great agriculture, awesome community, but yeah. not that big. Not that big, and you, this guy owns multiple businesses. So let's go check out, what is it, the original location yeah, the original. for Wing Central? Yeah, Wing Central. All right, you guys come with us. Yeah. What's the unique part about this location? We're surrounded by the Central Washington University uh, students. The school's across the street and the housing is all around us. And besides the real estate location, like to your story, what, what's special about the story? I mean, what's special is it, here is Wing Central is where it all started for me. This is the beginning. Yeah, okay. this is the That's beginning. Going yeah. The question begs itself looking at this building is what are your total lease costs on a monthly basis? So way back in uh, 2002, I think we were spending about $3,000 a month. Month. And here we are in 2022 and I bought the whole building. So yep, we're currently yep. paying ourselves $2 a square foot plus triple nets. Mm -hmm. And we have other tenants in the building. And so we split up that cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many ways you can do that. Own, lease, uh, for entrepreneurs with an idea, not a lot of funds. What's your advice when it comes to operating out of a building? I mean, I think location, location, location. Like you can't beat that. So you have to find a great location and that's gonna drive your traffic and your customers if you're doing a brick and mortar type of a mm -hmm. uh, of a business. And if you have no money, I think you need to team up with someone that does yeah. and they're out there. Cause you mentioned that you have another business that you're working on, which is what, a coffee shop? Yeah, a coffee shop. Tell us a little bit about I think it's a cool story. Why? So yeah. I love the college students and I wanted to give them a place to study and have that traditional kind of uh, coffee shop college experience. Cool and so we're, Yeah, so we're building the, the, the Bird Coffee and Kitchen right next door. Can we go take a look at Yeah, inside? let's go check it out. All right. All right, so this is the uh, in-progress coffee shop. Yeah, this is it. This is the Berg Coffee and Kitchen. So how much are you budgeting for this whole reno build out? And it's a crazy project. project because we started pre-COVID and we we're, oh, wow. were building it out with our own cash flow. Mm -hmm. And then COVID hit and our cash flow stopped. So this project's been here much longer than we've wanted. We're excited that we're gonna be opening next month. And total build out, probably about 200,000. So from restaurant to coffee shop, Jim, like, What's going on? How do you make these decisions as an entrepreneur? It's solving a problem. So we're up at the north end of Ellensburg, right in the middle of student housing, and there's nowhere near for them to go get a coffee or a Red Bull energy drink. So we're gonna give it to them. So you came to Ellensburg uh, and lived in a trailer? A camper trailer. We towed it behind like the truck. Like a fifth wheel? Yeah, fifth wheel trailer. Uh -huh and uh, we, we had a guy tow it over here. We parked it on uh, my mother-in-law's property and that was our plan was to stay in the fifth wheel trailer and live lean and open up a business and get it going, so. All right, well, let's continue the interview at your house. Yeah. Take us there. It won't be a trailer. All right, let's yeah. do it. It won't be a trailer. Thank you for letting us come to your home, by the way. Yeah, it's, my it's, pleasure. It's absolutely gorgeous, beautiful backdrop. Uh, what an amazing place. Apart from ghost kitchens, you started doing some side hustles, to, especially during COVID, right? Yeah. What were some of the most profitable and easiest ones to get into? Like, we just want to learn from that. Yeah, awesome. So I started a junk removal company. I saw some videos on YouTube of a couple doing it. And I looked at my wife, I'm like, you want to do junk removal with me? And she goes, nope. And I'm like, all right, I'll do it myself. So bought a trailer and started 509 junk removal. So once I was doing the junk removal, a lot of people were giving me stuff that wasn't junk. They just wanted to get rid of it. And I was like, wow, they're giving me stuff that still has value. So I started selling it. Now, Next, I started, I, I think I Googled side hustles and one of them that popped up was couch flipping. Hmm. And I'm like, I've Weird got the trailer. Yeah. I'm already getting furniture from other things. Let me see if I can do some couch flipping. So I started uh, looking in the ads on Craigslist for free furniture, free couches and messaging them and picking them up, cleaning them up and selling them. So last one, and this kind of okay. tied in with what I was doing. So I was selling used furniture with the couch flipping, and then I had all the stuff that I was getting from the junk removal. So I started buying storage units at auction. I always loved that TV show. It's fun, It's yeah. fun, right? My mom passed away, 
and I went Starting to out. clean out her storage unit, mm -hmm. and she had it for like 16 years. And I asked the guy at the at the storage unit complex, I said, what do you guys do? How do you guys auction these off? And he goes, oh, it's online. Check out this website. So I got on that website that night, bid and won a storage unit, went over, got all this stuff and was like, wow, I'm gonna make some money on this, and I did. And it's a hit and miss most of the time? It's or? always been a hit, actually. Really? So the last one, you were just at the coffee shop, mm -hmm. bid on a unit in Federal Way, got over there, asked the guy, what do you think that was running the storage unit? He goes, ah, there's some good scrap metal. <laughs> Opened up the door, behind the scrap metal was a brand new restaurant mixer that was about $3,000. Wow. And then about 25 of the chairs that we're gonna use at the coffee shop and they cost about 200 bucks a piece. Dude, that's I bought the cool. whole storage unit for about 600 bucks and got 200 in scrap metal, sold the mixer for 3,000, and I'm gonna use the chairs at the coffee shop. Something to look into. So I've been wanting to ask you, what is this rule of 10? Yeah, so rule of 10 is something that I heard and sometimes I just jump on something and take action and do it. So uh, I read that if you get 10% more customers, increase your profits 10%, and increase the amount of times your guests come back by 10%, you'll double your profits. I never did the math on it, but I like the idea, and so I just went after it. How can I increase everything by just 10%? And do you do that, what, every year? Or All every... the time, it's in my budget, it's what I work on in my marketing. And you know, I'm a one guest at a time type of a person, so mm -hmm. how do I get a guest, put them into my loyalty program, and keep them? I want 2024 to be your best year ever. I want your business to grow like crazy. But talking to entrepreneurs in my audience, I often hear they're having trouble growing. And looking at their businesses, sometimes things just don't look that professional. This happens to a lot of people. When I started, I ran my business from my personal phone, mixing up work and private messages. I lost some big opportunities. If you're running a business and talking to customers on the phone or by text, there's something you should check out. And that is today's sponsor, Nextiva. Nextiva lets you set up business phone numbers in different areas. So if you're a real estate investor dialing for deals, Nextiva will help you get more answers and close more deals. You get unlimited calling, business texting, and auto-attended voice analytics, and many more features that will make your business look as polished as a Fortune 500 company. Nextiva helps you handle all your chats and teamwork in one place. So you're not flipping between a dozen apps to get the job done. Don't let the wrong tools slow you down. Check out trynextiva.com forward slash upflip to get up to 50% off. Go to trynextiva.com forward slash upflip to start with a big discount. Talk to someone at Nextiva to see if it's right for you. Let's time with Jim. Let's get into it. Uh, why the name Wing Central? Ah, funny. So obviously we were doing chicken wings, but we took over a location that was called Teriyaki Central. We were opening that business with $30,000 of borrowed money, and we didn't want to spend a lot on a sign, so we just bought the letters W-I-N-G, Wing, no way. and changed the concept. And that's just stuck with you. That, yeah. That's pretty cool. All right, common misconception about the restaurant industry you'd like to debunk. I think it's a guest thing. Like, guests don't want to complain, but we actually want to fix every problem. Biggest one-time splurge that that you've ever had and what was it on? Uh, my family, vacations. I mean, we've made some crazy vacations, just flew. What's the best one? Or first class to the Bahamas and oh. uh, for the whole family and uh, stayed at the, a really nice resort and just enjoyed ourselves for a couple weeks. Nothing better than experiences. Yeah. Um, what is the most rewarding aspect of being an entrepreneur? I'm just waking up with the different challenges, right? So, mm -hmm. and the people that I get to work with, I have an awesome team. Can you share a b bizarre or amusing encounter you've had in the course of running your restaurant? I had a customer call my home phone and leave a message. He was really irritated that we had changed our French fries and he said he'd never be back. And then one day in the restaurant, he recognized me and we had changed the fries back and he goes, I'm glad you got my message. That is freaking yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. You're probably an easy person to find. Target, yeah, yeah. I guess so. Your Cause I was like, whoa, he called me at home. <laughs> Any contenders for best wings besides Wing Central? In Ellensburg? I don't know. No, we're the best. You're the best, okay. Yeah. Dream dinner companion, living or deceased, who would it be? Ah, uh, my mom. What about living? Yeah. I had dinner with my wife the other day and it was so nice. I'm a, if I could have a dinner with my wife and kids, that makes me happy. How are you dealing right now with like inflation, cost of raw food, materials, et cetera? Yeah, it's a huge challenge. For a while it was just getting products, mm -hmm. uh, supply chain, 
and and then we had food prices go way up and uh, so we immediately were raising our prices redoing our menus re-engineering our menus which is a really cool technique to make more money sometimes without actually raising prices what do you mean by that can you yeah so we more? cost every item out that we sell right so i can find the most profitable items on the menu and maybe highlight those and encourage you to mm -hmm. buy them mm -hmm. so i didn't raise the price i just made more money for the restaurant and uh, that works really well so even in my restaurant when you go and look at the menu the number one item in each category is making me good money mm -hmm. so but ultimately uh, in this business if you have increased costs it just gets passed down to the consumer 100 percent, right? because you got to keep your margins and so i mean the customer is always paying for everything right yes, yeah we try to be very efficient and we care about the consumer we don't want to outprice our our customers and so uh, we get really good at budgeting so we buy our labor from our projected sales so we're not overstaffed and wasting money hmm. elaborate more on what you just said because i don't think a lot of restaurants do that where they buy labor based on projected sales right sure so where did that come from what did you learn how can we learn yeah that so too? i learned that uh you know another mastermind group you did yeah and it was more of a financial mastermind group and it really opened my eyes to how I could control my business mm -hmm. uh, so much better. So I project what we're gonna do in sales for the week. So if I'm gonna do $50,000 in food sales, and I know I want my food cost to be 30%, I have $15,000 budgeted for food. Mm -hmm. If I want my labor to be 30% or maybe 20%, I have $10,000 to spend on labor, and then I write my schedule. Interesting. Then I just have to track each day, did my sales match my projected sales amount? Were they higher or were they lower and mm -hmm. adjust? So it becomes micro adjusting right. as opposed to the big purchase. Take us back to the very first year when you're getting into the restaurant world. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced? How did you overcome them? Sure, I specifically. mean, in the beginning, I had a challenge of just competing for a lease. So I thought I had a building leased and then Subway wanted the same space. Mm -hmm. And so the landlord was like, yeah. Subway yeah. or Jim and Shannon with no experience. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a salesperson and I went to him and I said, hey, I bet Subway wants you to do a lot of remodeling and I don't want you to do anything. I just want to give you the money and lease the space good proposition. and I'll take care of business. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to go with you guys. And so uh, we got the space. I think after that, I had no idea how to run a restaurant. Yeah. Luckily, I knew this, hire good people. And so I hired a young kid that had worked at a Red Robin, actually. Mm -hmm. And he came in the kitchen, and he was like, oh, let me fix this. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so mm -hmm. I just followed along. So it's not necessarily having to learn everything yourself, no. bring in the right team members that'll Yeah, for sure, over better. the years, all of our success goes to our employees. Like hire the right people, yeah. hire the right people, mm -hmm. uh, let them do their jobs, um, sit down, ask them good questions. Then we got in a mastermind group, which took us to a different level. And uh, and then just studying all the time. I'm, I go out and eat and I talk to the owners and talk to the chefs and, mm -hmm. and see what people are doing. I also, through consulting, I think you learn a lot when you're teaching. And uh, so from teaching other people how to solve their problems, I overcome my own. You mentioned joining a mastermind group. How did that happen? Uh, how did it help as well? It was a marketing mastermind group and uh, to learn how to get more customers to come into your business. And so they were relentless with their marketing. It just kept showing up and showing up. And so finally I said, you know what? I'm gonna go to one of their events. And I went and uh, learned a lot. And I said, mm. I, have to, I have to jump into this. I have to keep learning from these people because they know so much. What did it cost you to get in? It was $1,000 a month. And back then I remember telling my wife, hey, I just spent $1,000 a month to be in this uh, group. And she looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. Yeah. And uh, I said, but don't worry, because they have a contest and I'm gonna win a Porsche. How long was that process, by the way? It was a year. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. So 1,000 bucks a month for yeah. a whole year. Yeah. And how often, like what's, what's your advice in general to people watching for joining masterclasses, like how do we go about that? Yeah, I mean, you want to find one that uh, has people in it that are at a level that you want to try to uh, mm. grow to, yeah. and and they have to be willing to share, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a group of like-minded people that are willing to share and help you grow, and that's what I found. And so we would travel around the country three times a year and go explore other restaurants, talk to the chefs, talk to the owners, and uh, and then talk between ourselves 
and overcome some of our problems and situations, it was a huge help for us. It was a game changer, actually. Yeah, and it's not an expense, right? It's more of an no. investment that you make as yeah. far as the cost. Oh yeah, I made hundreds of thousands of dollars because of this mastermind group. Well worth it. What are the profit margins like in the restaurant business? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the national average uh, is about 5%. Our mm. goal is 20%. Wow. And uh, we work really hard with systems to hopefully hit that goal. Mm -hmm. So for those that want to get into the business, Jim, how do we specifically understand ways to improve margins? Like, can you give us a few ideas? I've done the whole gamut. And so lucky enough, at some point I was taught to use a yearly budget mm -hmm. and that changed my whole world. So. I actually was about to open up my restaurant for the day and I built my yearly budget for the following year and it showed me right at the bottom how much I was going to make that year. And I was like, wow, do I want to work the whole year and make that number? Mm -hmm. And I didn't. And so I started changing my menu, changing my portion sizes, some of the products we bought, looking to save labor, all sorts of things. But I right. think it all starts with a good yearly budget. So if I'm running a little too rich, right? What are some things to today look at as far as numbers to see if I can cut it, if I can improve margins? What would it be? Would it be labor? Sure. Would it be food costs? Yeah, it's both of those. So that's Just called prime two? cost in our industry, right? Got food it. and labor costs combined. Mm -hmm. We have a goal of hitting 60. Some of our restaurants do better and some uh, uh, are working on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How is that split between labor and, and food costs? If we're going to have a higher food cost, then we need to look at ways to save on labor. If we're going to have a higher labor cost, then we're gonna look at ways to save on food. So it doesn't matter the mix, mm -hmm. it's just the end okay. goal is 60%. Because I was gonna say, yeah, it could be 20% on food costs, but yeah. it's 40% on labor. It could be. Okay. So if you're a scratch made kitchen, maybe you're saving on food costs, True. Yeah. right? If you're a steakhouse, you're probably saving on labor because you don't have a lot of prep. Mm -hmm. So there's some ways to uh, hit those numbers. You're not spending a whole ton of money on paid advertising, correct? Yeah, not a ton. Uh, let's talk about how you get customers through the door. What are some secrets uh, in terms of marketing that doesn't involve the whole lot of money? I think the big thing is creating experiences. So from little things like on Tuesdays, we have a guy that makes balloons for all the kids. So Tuesdays is a big day for us that for families. Cool. Kids have been coming here for years. They know you, the balloon man. And our Tuesday sales, when we started, the balloons went up 40%. So I think uh, the key to a good marketing is a database, customer database. Mm -hmm. So if you're brand new, you Absolutely. don't have one. So you need to go find someone that has a really good database and maybe partner with them. So I could go to the car wash down the street and give them an offer that says, hey, if you get the premier car wash, that helps them. Maybe they get a free appetizer at the Roadhouse Grill and it drives their customers into my business. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody wants to get into the restaurant business. Like what would be the minimum, especially these days, to, to get going? How, how would you do it with everything that you know today? I would find someone that already owns a restaurant that needs a little bit of uh, energy and life put into it. And I would mm -hmm. approach them and say, listen, I'm ready to work hard and rebuild this business. Uh, but I need the opportunity. And if the right person walks in with uh, the right attitude, uh, they might get the, the opportunity. Interesting, so you're not starting uh, a brick and mortar building from scratch, because that obviously requires a lot of capital. No, yeah, right? that's too much money. I think you need to walk into something that's already open mm -hmm. and just need some help. Like I'm really good at marketing and the numbers of the restaurant business. So I actually was given a restaurant for mm -hmm. free. And so I walked into it and just- Restaurant for free. Restaurant for free. They were losing $50,000 a month. And I took over and just went over the, the math problem of running a restaurant, food cost, labor cost, mm -hmm. and first month made money. What if I have an, a unique food idea? There is no restaurant that's serving the type of menu that I want, and I still want to get into that industry. How would, how would you go about that? That typically scares me because yeah. you're, you're trying to prove the market. And so for a first restaurant, I'd want something that everyone's already eating and I just do it better. Well said. What is the most interesting marketing trick that you've pulled in the past 20 sure. years? Sure, when we opened our second restaurant, we were busy, but I wasn't sure how much of the market we had actually captured. And so I created the Ellensburg Restaurant Review website and I posted oh. a review spot with the, the news on their website and people would go in and do a blind review basically rating their favorite restaurants. And then I got to ask questions like, have you ate at this particular restaurant? Have you ate at the Roadhouse Grill? So I'd start to capture that data on uh, had they been a guest with us or not. If they had been a guest, I sent them an offer 
that was a little bit smaller offer just to get them in again. Mm -hmm. If they hadn't been a guest, I sent them a larger offer, like maybe a free appetizer to get them in for the first time. And uh, I read a really good book by Dan Kennedy, No BS Marketing, and I used a lot of what he talked about. It was fantastic. And so mm -hmm. I'm good at taking action. That's what I was gonna say, you're an executor. Yeah. You know something, you, Let's you go. go and do it. Yeah, and so I heard about this uh, review process, someone else had used it. And I thought, mm, good idea. And I think the next week I had it up and running. How important is an email list and like what kind of impact do you see for the business? Yeah, so I think email is still the number one way to reach a guest and super important. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've built our database over years. I think we're up to about 15,000 wow. in a town of 20,000. That's crazy. Yeah. You've been around for 20 plus years now, right? Yeah, it gives me a way to control the flow of my business and mm -hmm. reach out to someone with an offer that's captivating and bring them in. So super important to how we run our business. But for a brick and mortar that's just starting out, little database, for example, what yeah. are some secrets on getting people's emails? How do you do that? Because yeah. when I go to Red Robin, nobody's asking me for an email. I mean, that's the biggest problem. So if you want to build an email list, you have to have a plan on how you're going to accomplish it mm -hmm. and have some way of measuring your results. So we started a loyalty program. So I want to know your name, your email, your birthday, your anniversary, as much as I possibly can. So when I send you an email, it makes sense, mm -hmm. right? And so we might reach out to you easily with a birthday offer. Like, hey, if you fill this out, you'll get a free birthday dinner at the Roadhouse Grill. Right. For restaurants watching that don't have a loyalty, that's probably a good step it's, to it's change like immediately. Immediately, it's yeah. the number one thing I would do. You know, when I started my loyalty uh, program, I got to start tracking my guest. I didn't know, I thought I did because I was here every day. I thought I knew who my best guest was mm -hmm. until I saw the loyalty numbers. And I was like, wow, I don't even know these people. So I actually went and asked one of my servers, I'm like, next time these people are in, please introduce me because they were the ones spending the most money inside my building. Interesting. Yeah. Let's talk about loyalty programs. Do they work and expand on the details? I think loyalty programs, when they're set up uh, the right way, can be huge for your business. For one thing, you're saying thank you uh, to your best guest. So when I opened up my second restaurant, I couldn't be at both places at once, mm -hmm. but I still wanted to say thank you to those people that were taking care of us. And so the loyalty program did that automatically. They might get an email from me, they might get a postcard from me, they might get a reward from me. Mm -hmm. And so it was a way of keeping us in touch. Plus I got to see who was actually uh, being a loyal guest and mm -hmm. taking care of our business. What about the continuity, something? Uh, yeah, the so. The percent of sales increased? Sure, increased. so I started a gift card continuity program uh, the year I won the Porsche. So we had a gift card contest and I said, why sell small dollar gift cards? Why not sell a bigger one? Mm -hmm. So I sold a thousand dollar gift card and I named it the 12 months of Christmas. Wow. So each month, when you gave me the thousand dollars in December, I'd give you a $100 gift card each month for the next 12 months, which was a 20% discount. But oh, the yeah. average, the national average of gift cards not getting used is like 18%. So really it was about a wash those two free months. Oh, I see. Right? Because yeah. people don't use the small change left on a gift card or they just stop using it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they lose them. There's all sorts of reasons. Hmm. And so what I found out is those customers that bought the $1,000 gift card came in each month and on average spent 17% more than they did the previous year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very good. It's That's the one. importance of knowing your numbers, right? It's Tracking huge. all these things. Yeah. I think knowing your break-even point in your business because it's easy to, to market yourself and actually sell yourself out of business mm -hmm. if your food cost is off, if your labor's off. It's just a way for you to go broke quicker. Right. Right? So you need to know your numbers. You need to know your break-even. And once you pass break-even, that's when you're making big profit. At this point in your career, you're consulting other business owners, restaurant owners, right? Yeah. Uh, what's the number one reason that you found that restaurants maybe don't make as much money as they can or should be? Yeah, I think the number one thing is they just don't know their numbers. So like this, they operate a business and not know their numbers? 100%. Pretty common? I've done consulting for restaurants all over the country. Really good restaurants. You walk in, they're busy, they, the employees are happy, everything the guests are happy, good. everything looks good they don't know how much the hamburger or the steak on the plate costs them to make. That's crazy. It's really crazy. It's the only business I know that operates like this. So you're telling me if you serve me a dish today for lunch, for example, you you, you know exactly the numbers really close. that it takes to, to get that. Yeah, plate. so when we make a batch recipe for maybe like our 
uh, Alfredo sauce, right? Mm -hmm. We'll measure all the ingredients, get our yield, and figure out our cost per ounce, and then that goes into our recipe. Mm -hmm. We have a pretty sophisticated system that we use that uh, updates it with each purchase. Mm -hmm. So as our new costs come in, it adjusts our, our food cost. It's just interesting to get into a restaurant business and not want to know your numbers. I think of like it's a car dealership, time. like they know how much the cars on their lot cost them, right? And they know how many cars they have. But for some reason in the restaurant industry, and I think that's the big reason there's so much failure, True. is people just don't know their numbers and they don't do the work to figure it out. Yeah, and there's a lot of variables, right? Right, right. and they so. think they'll succeed and just kind of make it by. But yeah. most get shut down, what, in the first year? That's or what fail? they say. As we talk about knowing your numbers, check out our episode with Max, the owner of Narrative Coffee. We'll have it somewhere here. I think you'll learn a lot uh, as, as well as far as knowing your numbers and operating your business successfully. You have mentioned sales skills and the importance of it. Uh, you've had a lot of it in your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. What sets you apart as a salesman? What do you think you want to highlight? I think the main thing is be focused on solving your customers' problems, right? You're not selling a product, you're solving a solution. And uh, that's usually what I focus on. And, uh, and then I also just believe nothing happens without a sale. You know, selling a chicken wing to someone is selling an experience. Um, they wanna maybe have that hot, spicy buffalo experience. Beer 101, selling beer to a college student, not the hardest thing to do in the world. So, <laughs> anyway, yeah. That's true. So you're obviously living a pretty comfortable life. You've been working very hard for the last 20 plus years. Uh, people like to know sometimes, like, how do you spend the money you earn today? You know, do you collect knives or coins or whatever? Anything shocking? I wish I had something exciting. I have a hard time spending money on myself. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, my wife doesn't, and so she'll plan our vacations, Balances which are out. amazing. So I think we love awesome. to go out and uh, have experiences traveling around the world. Yeah. And we've done a bunch of that. And so we had a motorhome. We drove around the whole country during COVID um, and visited all my clients around the country. So, you know, this is 20 years, and right. I think that's it's a important. Big right. I think it's important. Sometimes people are seeing the finished product, yeah. but they don't see the first part of that, which is Jim and Shannon, she's the waitress, I'm the cook every day, all day, Right. Uh, and you keep grinding. Yeah, you've earned it. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Before we continue, just a quick favor, you guys, a simple subscribe and like, not only lets us know and our team that you appreciate this video, you're enjoying watching it, uh, but it also helps us bring better and better guests each time. So would you guys do that huge favor right now? We greatly appreciate it. So I noticed these things. Can you tell us a little bit about what this is? It says Beer 101. Probably for Wing Central, the best marketing thing I ever did. We bought 101 different beers, which was hard to do back in 03. Wow. There wasn't that many. And uh, so we added 101 beers to the restaurant. We created the Beer 101 Club where students actually come in, they pay $5 to join, and then they start drinking all 101 beers. And when they're done, they get a- Not in one sit down. Not at once, yeah. Sometimes it takes a year, <laughs> two years, maybe their whole four years of college, right? Wow. And each time they drink a beer, we mark it off. And then when they're done, we have a graduation party and their plaque goes up on the wall, so. It's kind of cool. It makes the yeah. vibe here pretty- Yeah, exactly. Pretty cool. How do you think coming from a single parent household, Jim, has shaped your entrepreneurial spirit? Yeah, I think that uh, as a young kid being at home alone, I, I talked earlier about it, I watched all the cooking shows on uh, TV and fell in love with becoming a chef. And so uh, here I am today, 20 years later, as the head chef for all of our restaurants. And as a single parent child, uh, my parents got divorced and I remember hearing like, hey, uh, your dad didn't pay child support this month. And I think that drove me to, uh, to find my own worth. Like I didn't think I was worth the $150 a month that he was supposed to pay. Oh, man. Yeah. And so I get out of bed every day, like let me prove it. Like I am worth, I'm worth way more than $150 obviously. And, mm -hmm. and, and then I get to correct those things with my family, right? I have a fantastic family and the kids are healthy and uh, don't have some of these same childhood scars that I think right. a lot of people walk around with. If you want more industry secrets that you don't hear about every day, make sure to check out upflip.com for in-depth tutorials and guides. Was the money worth it? Does it bring happiness, Jim? What do you think? Yes and yes, yeah. it was worth it and it does bring some happiness. It gives me opportunities to do some stuff that I've never uh, thought that I could do as a kid. We've done some amazing things in Ellensburg. The, at one point, uh, our local food bank burnt down 
and we fed everyone for free until they got reestablished. Wow. And we have a nice scholarship cool. program at the university, um, at Central Washington University for kids that are working in the restaurant business and trying to get a degree at the same time. And also, uh, one of my employees started a junk removal business after me, and so, uh, getting to kind of pass on my knowledge. It's a lot easier to do that when, you, when you're when you not uh, worried about your bills. Right, right. it's a good feeling. Yeah. Do you think anybody can become a millionaire? What do you say to that? Two things. A million isn't what it used to be. True. And I do think anyone can become a millionaire. I think there's so many opportunities in 2023 in the restaurant business, outside of the restaurant business. Your guys' channel is a perfect example of people taking action and getting things done. So right. I wish, and I hope by doing this uh, episode with you guys that more people see it and take action and do something because Absolutely. the opportunity is out there. I'll give my email address. Anyone can reach out to me. I'd love to help someone. We appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, this is 2024 in case people ah, wonder. That, I'm hey, they, off they, a year. Yeah. They're like, hey, are they, did they do this interview again? last year? No, no, okay. it's, it's fine. That's I think. funny. So with thousands of five-star reviews across your businesses, uh, Jim, uh, what is the secret to great customer service? And maybe asking for that feedback as well, because sometimes it's hard to get feedback. Yeah. So for me, I think uh, a perfect restaurant experience as the customer mm -hmm. is uninterrupted. And that means a lot of things. And that's why this business is so tricky. Sometimes you get that group of guests that want to have fun. And if you don't have fun with them, that's kind of interrupting their experience. I see. I proposed to my wife at a restaurant. And so I wanted that romantic moment. If the server would have came up to the table with a joke and being really loud and fun, that would have interrupted my service. True. So I think uninterrupted service where, the, you know, you leave a restaurant and you go, that was great, but you didn't really notice what happened. Hmm. And I think that's what great service is all about. Now, there's a big greeting, there's hospitality, there's all these things the that we can do things, yeah. to make it even better. And then to uh, kind of help promote these days, to get us online, we have QR codes on the table. Mm. Try to make it as easy as possible for our guests to reach out and say, hey, you guys did a great job. What's one widely held belief about entrepreneurship in general that you think you disagree with? I think a lot of people don't think it's attainable, that they can do it. We went to school, then we got a job with a big union company, went to work for 30, 40 years, and then retired. Yeah. And from a young age, I was like, I wanna own my own business. And everyone looked at me like I was crazy. Hmm. And so, even in my own family, like you're the crazy kid that wants to uh, uh, start something on his own. So but it's possible, yeah, attainable. It's, yeah. Let's settle this debate between franchise and starting your own. What do you think? What, what should entrepreneurs do? Yeah, I mean, I think that some franchises can be a great way to get into business and yeah. really expand quickly. The systems are there, the vendors are there, the marketing should be there, but you have to look at the franchise individually because not everybody is there to support you. I'm okay. a creative person and so I always just started my own uh, concept. So at one point we had five different restaurants. Each one of them was a completely different concept. Mm -hmm. It's a really hard way to be in the restaurant business because you don't have that continuity between stores. Where a franchise, if you're opening up a, a taco time, for right, instance, you stick to it. Yeah, stick to it. The same burrito at every location makes life a little bit easier. So what do you have right now? Restaurants, locations? Please. Yeah. So I have Wing Central, the original. Mm -hmm. I have Ellensburg Brewing uh, in downtown Ellensburg, where we manufacture beer and cider and serve food mm -hmm. and then we have the roadhouse grill that we're in right now steaks burgers a nice family restaurant and then we have the food truck carlos and jimmy's and we're in the middle of building out uh, the bird coffee and kitchen coffee shop wow all right in the past 20 years give us uh, a really interesting customer story what you learned from that yeah so i think my most interesting customer story actually was our first customer and uh dan flock came in and ordered a college burger and we were just so excited to make someone the best burger I could possibly make and give the best service we could possibly give and earn his business. And so this is 22 years later. I literally remember that moment when Dan walked in mm -hmm. and ordered a college burger, $3.99 with fries, e 2002, that is Wing wild. Central Ellensburg. So just um, the feeling it gave you. That's yeah, and that's what just... that, that sale kind of built the foundation for mm -hmm what we were gonna do for the next 20 years. That's awesome. Yeah, one customer at a time is what I say, is earn your business one customer at a time, and don't forget how lucky you are that people are coming in to spend their money with you. Yeah, and eating the food you make. Yeah. Everyone watching could 
or would have to read only three books for the rest of their lives, what would they be and why? I really, in this business, like the book Hospitality from the Heart. And it talks about that, like how do you take care of a guest and what are the little things you can look for to really make their uh, experience wonderful. So mm -hmm. that's a great book. Uh, Think and Grow Rich, uh, which is all about we the mastermind group. Yeah. Um, and the third one, uh, there's a book called The One Thing, and I use mm -hmm. that all the time Keller Williams. on what's the most important thing I can get done today. And uh, I try to accomplish that. So today it's you guys, mm -hmm. and I'm going to get this accomplished, and, uh, and then we'll move on. Rock and roll. Enjoy this episode and think that it can't get even better? It can. Check out my favorite episode 169 with Chef Vinny, the chicken frying king. Boom. Take a second to like and subscribe. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Jim. Boom. <laughs>